Well, welcome to Christian Answers. This is Pastor Jeff Short, your Bible teacher and cultural analyst. And today I'm going to be dealing with the topic of the scandal at Church Militant, which is a traditionalist Catholic media organization in Ferndale, Michigan, and the downfall of their founder and leader, Michael Voris. And I just want to share my connection with this organization because I was born and raised in Michigan, and I was born and raised around the Northville, Michigan area. And so I'm in Northville, Michigan quite a bit, uh, visiting family and friends. And so I began to hear about and learn about on the internet this media company called Church Militant. I think that was around 2013 or so. And I began to tune into some of the programming that they had, because as a Protestant, as an evangelical Christian, I'm always interested in what the more traditionalist Catholics are saying. Um, I don't pay much attention to the liberal Catholics or the leftist Catholics, because uh, I've learned from Protestantism, if you're going to listen to Christianity, you need to listen to the purest form. You need to listen to the uh, most uh, traditional and the strictest orthodox form of that group to learn about what they really believe, because the liberal church will basically say anything in order to please the world or compromise to the world. That's just the way liberalism is. So if you have liberalism in the Catholic church, you're never going to get a straight answer. And if you get liberalism in the Protestant church, you'll never get a straight answer. So you need to go to the more orthodox traditional groups that stick more closely to the original teachings. So if I listen to Catholic media at all, I listen to the traditionalists because they're the ones that actually defend something and they actually are trying to promote something. And what is uh, Church Militant and its founder, Michael Voris, what are they trying to promote? They're trying to promote traditionalist Roman Catholic teachings. And what I liked about what I saw on Church Militant since I think around 2013, when I began to catch wind of some of their programming, especially something like uh, the Vortex that Michael Voris presented a maybe 10 or 15 minute uh, segment on some topic. And what I really appreciated from him and his entire media group there was their boldness and their courage and no equivocating and their strong outspokenness in exposing the corruption in the Roman Catholic Church. So it's not news at all by now. It's probably widespread in our culture that the Roman Catholic hierarchy is corrupt. There have been all kinds of scandals over the last 25 years alone, just in the last 25 years, starting in the, for example, around the year 2000, this whole uh, pedophile uh, sex abuse, children sex abuse scandal that engulfed the entire Roman Catholic Church, especially in the United States. And then around 2010, you had another uh, wave of scandal, and this time it was more or less the uh, priests and some bishops and even a cardinal were found to be acting immorally toward not underage um, people, but... acting immorally with of-age people, so to speak, uh, and uh, grooming of uh, seminarians and all kinds of corrupt and perverted uh, wicked behavior on the part of some priests and bishops. And the cover-up then that happened afterwards where the hierarchy would circle the wagons and try to sweep under the rug all of these corrupt priests and bishops and even cardinals. And so this was, again, exposed. So you had a first wave around 2000s, and then you had around 2010 or 2008 or 2010 or uh, around there, you had a second wave. And again, a, a big problem in the Roman Catholic Church. Well, Church Militant and Michael Voris, its founder, were not afraid to actually call a spade a spade and say, hey, this is wrong. We're going to hold these leaders accountable. We're going to hold them to the standards of the Bible, and in their case, tradition. As Protestants, we go to the Bible, and that is our 
standard and tradition. We don't add uh, church tradition on top of the Bible. We say the Bible is the standard, the Bible is the tradition that we follow, and anything found in the Bible is the standard. And so we use that as the measuring stick in the Roman Catholic Church, a little bit different. They use scripture, but then scripture is always interpreted by the tradition of the Roman Catholic Church as interpreted by the magisterium. So you have a second and a third degree of authority in, in their church. But because what it basically ends up is the magisterium, the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, decides what is valid tradition and what is valid scripture interpretation. So it's basically sola ecclesia rather than sola scripture. They don't see the scripture, the Bible, the word of God, as the sole authority in their church. They see the Bible and then as it's interpreted by the magisterium and as it's interpreted in the context of church history. So they have a number of different authorities all sort of clustered around each other and out throughout all of those authorities, then they come up with what is to be taught. And what is to be taught is basically um, the standards that have been held, um, they claim, for uh, centuries and centuries. And Church Militant and Michael Voris held the hierarchy to the standards that have always been taught in the Roman Catholic Church on morality, uh, on, on finances, on uh, decisions, and so forth, and held the clergy to the, their feet to the fire, so to speak. And I always appreciated the willingness of church militant reporters and Michael Voris in pointing out the scandals in the Roman Catholic Church and the inconsistencies and the hypocrisies and holding them to that high standard. Because a lot of times in the Roman Catholic Church, you will get people who will try to defend the church at all cost. And today, we have a lot of people called Pope Splainers, especially on the internet, who will bend over backwards and contradict themselves and square the circle, so to speak, to try to bring into harmony what Pope Francis, for example, the current Pope, says as it lines up with church traditional teachings. And it's very hard for them to do that, but it's sort of a challenge for some people on the internet, especially the lay people. It's really a challenge for them to try to spin what Pope Francis says and try to bring it into harmony with the historical church teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. And it gets really comical almost to see how people are bending over backwards to try to make Pope Francis seem like he's Orthodox, when in fact he is actually teaching heterodoxy. He's actually teaching in some places heresy. Um, for example, he said that uh, it is God's will that there be a diversity of religions. So Islam, uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, all the pagan religions, that's God's will, evidently, from, according to Pope Francis, it's God's will that there be all of these uh, diverse religions competing against and even contradicting and opposing Christianity. Well, no, uh, that is such a blatantly false statement. Uh, the only way that that can be true in any sense is that, well, all things in one sense are God's will, his permissive will, he allows all things, evidently, uh, that actually come to be because he can, by his own power, stop things from happening, or he can allow them to happen, or he can cause things to happen, or he cannot cause things to happen. So in the, in the total sovereignty of God, yes, whatever comes to be is actually within the total sovereign will of God, of course, but that's not what we mean when we mean the will of God. We mean what is God's uh, will, his perfect will of God, and that's expressed in his law. You know, it's, it's expressed in the word of God and the moral Christian uh, teachings. And so it is not uh, the will of God, uh, according to Christianity, that Satan be able to deceive the minds of people uh, all over the world in these false religions. And so if you want to say it's the will of God, for all these religions to exist and thrive, then you can go as far as saying, well, it's the will of God that we don't evangelize then because 
um, if it's the will of God that these religions are, are existing and thriving and opposing Christianity, we might as well leave them alone because it's the will of God. No, it's, it's, it's a contradiction. It's a false teaching. It was wrongly spoken by Pope Francis, and there have been many Pope splainers to try to figure out how to explain it away. But the people at Church Militant, uh, taking the lead of their founder, Michael Voris, are boldly exposing the lies and falsehoods and false teachings of the Roman Catholic hierarchy. And what I've seen in my years of observing them, and I don't follow, I never followed all of the vortexes uh, that Michael Voris presented. I never followed all of the downloads. That was the more panel discussion, or I didn't watch all the time the uh, evening news and some of their other investigative reporting. But I was impressed by the boldness and the outspokenness and the courage of their convictions to actually state the traditional Roman Catholic views. So that initially attracted me to that ministry, Church Militant, and also the fact that they're in Ferndale, Michigan, which is where my father used to work in broadcasting at another company called General Television Network, um, which originally started in Ferndale and then it moved uh, out further in Oak Park, which is down the street. And so this church militant headquarters is in Ferndale. So uh, my father and myself uh, decided one day, let's go out there and see what their uh, studio is looking like and their equipment control room and see what kind of uh, setup they have because I'm very interested in promoting Christianity through the use of internet and broadcast medium. So we decided to go down there. I called the church militant up. The secretary said, fine, come on down. We'll give you a tour of the place. And so we came down there and we saw their nice, very nice studio. It was professional lighting. They had chroma key green background. They had a a boom crane for the cameras so that you can bring it up and down and show it moving and very, very professional setup. And the, all of this was actually started by Michael Voris a few years earlier with the help of some investors. And they only spent, I think it was, they only spent a few hundred thousand dollars, which is not very much for a whole big setup like that. So they really started on what you might say a shoestring for, for a huge uh, studio like that. And then we went into the control room. They had really good equipment, uh, professional cameras, um, microphone setups, uh, switchers, uh, sound mixing consoles, and all kinds of professional gear. So they really were going into this in a really serious way. And the vision for this church militant was to spread this traditional Catholic teachings and expose the lies and corruption in the hierarchy and try to reform the church from within. So uh, we were given the grand tour. We saw they had a, a studio. Like I said, they had a, a nice control room with operators in there controlling different functions of the broadcast. We didn't see an actual live broadcast taking place, but we got to tour the place. They have a uh, editing area where they had, at that time, they probably had about five or six people back there editing different programs that would go out on the internet. Uh, they had volunteers from different churches coming in to help. They had a chapel that I guess they used in the morning for prayers. Uh, and then we got to meet Michael Voris in his office, it, all his book-lined office. And he evidently had a lot of theological books. I guess he had gone to seminary for a while. And he had a background in broadcasting, so my dad got to talk to him. We talked to him a little bit about the church militant, and then we left. And so I was really impressed with his setup, actually inspired that this is something you can do on a shoestring. So it really encouraged me that to continue on in the pursuit of broadcasting and using the new internet as a means of broadcasting Christian teachings. Now, his teaching, Michael Voris's teachings and church militant are traditionalist Catholic. Like I said, I would totally disagree on a lot of things that they promote. They're very strong, staunch Catholics, as you can imagine. Um, they pray to Mary. Uh, they look to the Pope as the authority. Uh, they're committed to doctrines like purgatory 
and all kinds of different uh, teachings that are not found in the Bible. So as a, as a Protestant, I totally reject all of these extra biblical teachings that they have and promote strongly. And of course, they see Protestants as outside of the, the church and therefore outside of salvation. And so they would look upon me as a biblical Christian, as someone outside of the church and outside of salvation in need of coming to into the church. And so they would go after me as an evangelistic convert they would try to get me to to be. But that overlooking all of those differences, I really saw uh, people who are not afraid to speak the truth as they understand it, not wishy-washy, not equivocating, uh, very clear, very dogmatic, very certain, very confident in what they're pushing. Okay, so uh, over the years since that visit we had down there in Ferndale, um, I guess they've grown even, and now they have even a bigger studio, and they have a bigger control room. And so about, I think it was about five years later, I decided that I would go down there and actually catch a live video taping or video production uh, in their new control room in a new studio and so forth. So I took it upon myself again. This is it's like four or five years later, to go down there by myself. And I said to the secretary, I'd like to just sit in to the control room and watch the show being produced and um, see what kind of equipment you have and see if you've upgraded and try to find out what this shoestring operation is like, you know, years later. So I went down there and they were taping uh, a Vortex with Michael Voris. So he's in the studio and I'm sitting in the control room and I'm taking notes and I'm learning what they're doing and looking at their equipment and looking at their uh, recording equipment, Blackmagic design, switcher, and all kinds of different technical things that were very interesting, all kinds of monitors, flat screen monitors, and looking at their um, cameras and all of their upgraded equipment it was very impressive. And so uh, I got to see a really good glimpse of what it looked like then with their new studio and upgrades. So uh, that was probably five years ago. And so I've tuned in off and on uh, to some of their programming and realized that they really have gotten improvement in their documentaries, in their exposés. They were doing more investigative journalism and exposing more corruption in the Roman Catholic Church. And I really appreciated all of their investigative reports and Michael Voris's criticisms of the hierarchy. I mean, he it doesn't spare anyone. I mean, he at first they started out mostly criticizing the bishops and priests for the corruption at more of the local level. And then they began to branch out into criticisms of cardinals, which is a higher level bishop, and especially around the Cardinal McCarrick scandal and all of the filth and moral depravity of this Cardinal McCarrick along the East Coast. And then uh, at some point, uh, the Francis, Pope Francis comments got to the point where church militant couldn't even explain or Pope explain Pope Francis, the current Pope. Because for a long time, uh, Michael Voris and church militant would say, we, we criticize the priests, we criticize bishops, and even now Cardinal McCarrick and the cardinals and the hierarchy, but we won't criticize the Pope because we want to respect him uh, and be good Catholics. Well, there came a day when they basically flipped the switch and said, we can no longer justify and explain Pope Francis. And actually, I think it was Michael Voris at Church Militant came out and said, we call for the resignation of Pope Francis. And this is really, uh, in the Catholic world, a bold and radical step where you actually call for the resignation of a sitting pope. So again, you know, I really admired the boldness and the outspokenness and the real sharp criticisms where criticisms were due and the unwillingness to simply justify everything that goes on in the Catholic Church and explain it away or cover it up or spin it in, in a way that would seem acceptable. And so I've always respected the ruthless critique 
that Church Militant made on the Roman Catholic Church, because I think that that kind of expose and critique really helps the church in the sense that if people in the hierarchy and the leadership know that they're going to be held to account and they're going to be exposed for their sins and corruption, then they will be deterred from doing that. And they will be checked and they will fear, put the fear of God in them, that they will lose their reputations and they will lose their positions and they will be involved in scandal and it causes a big mess. And so it's better not to do that, even if they are not inclined in their own internal holiness and spiritual maturity through the power of the Holy Spirit to, to clean up their act, they are then deterred and motivated to clean up their act based on somebody, uh, one of the critical voices in the Catholic world, like Church Militant, will expose him. Now, Church Militant is not the only critical voice exposing corrupt uh, Catholic leaders. Uh, there's also the Remnant video with Michael Matt. There is also the Gordon brothers, Timothy Gordon and David Gordon. They're outspoken in their criticism of Catholic corruption. There's Taylor Marshall, who has probably one of the largest platforms in the traditional Catholic realm for criticizing uh, Rome and the Vatican and in its corruption. And you have all kinds of other people doing the same thing. But Church Militant had risen in that arena to one of the leading voices of accountability in the Roman Catholic world. So I always admired that. Now, what has happened is that in November, um, if you went on the internet, you began to see uh, news that uh, Church Militant has now fired their founder and CEO, Michael Voris. And why did they do that? For violation of the morality clause in their bylaws. So uh, what did Michael Voris do that got him booted from his own organization? And what he did was he lapsed back into this wicked, evil, homosexual lifestyle. Evidently, there is evidence that he went back into that. And at the same time, he's criticizing the Roman Catholic hierarchy for all of its ethical and moral failures and its corruption and its hypocrisy and its two-faced pronouncements of one thing and then actions being totally different. And now he is being caught in that same sin of hypocrisy and immorality. So he gets booted, and now the whole existence of this organization, this media company, is up in the air right now. But what I want to say is, yes, he needed to be removed because obviously hypocrisy and being double-minded and being a liar, presenting yourself one way and being actually another way in reality is wrong, and there's no place for that in any kind of leadership. Even if you're a secular company, there's no place for hypocrisy and lying and covering up. And so the very thing that Church Militant is known for in exposing the lies and falsehoods and corruptions and hypocrisies, it was in a sense, doing with Michael Voris for those people that knew he was doing this, and Michael Voris himself, who knows better than to try to push himself out as this crusader of righteousness and holding others accountable when he isn't even holding himself accountable to live the moral teachings of Christianity. And so uh, the hypocrisy was so high and so deep that he had to go and I'm glad that they got rid of him because there's no place for that in any kind of uh, Christian ministry. Uh, hypocrisy, that was one of the strongest things that Christ condemned in the Pharisees was their hypocrisy, you know, cleaning the outside of the cup, but inside is full of dead men's bones and so forth. So the corruption had to stop. But the my take on the whole thing is that the criticisms and the expose of church militant was valid and still is valid because you need to have organizations and groups and ministries who hold church leaders accountable. It's the same way in the Protestant church. For example, when Andy Stanley uh, teaches false doctrine to his congregation, and all of the people that watch him on the internet through his services, when he's teaching false doctrine, there needs to be 
uh, voices in the evangelical world, and there needs to be organizations in the evangelical world that call him out and say, repent and expose him and actually um, confront him and say, you are not holding to the standards of the teachings of the Word of God. Because for so long, a lot of times, there's this friendly, nice attitude in the church environment where nobody wants to say anything wrong or nobody wants to make waves or nobody wants to say anything in a negative light or critical of anyone because we all just want to get along. And it's in the evangelical leadership world, for example, the speakers conference circuit and the authors, the the top selling authors that make a lot of money for the publishing companies and the people who are on high profile platforms they know each other somewhat and they try to work together with each other and they don't want to have people holding them accountable or questioning things that they're doing because then if you question me I'll question you and 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 there's an environment where there's a lot of negativity well the problem with that is there needs to be accountability in the Christian world and this can take place uh, among even Protestants uh, as well as Catholics. For example, uh, decades ago, Tony Campolo was teaching and writing things that were not in accordance with the Word of God. They were outside the boundaries or the pale of orthodoxy, and there were leaders in the Christian world, evangelical Christians, who called him out on the carpet and actually confronted him, and he was then forced to retract some of those teachings and apologize for it. And that's good. That's a good thing to happen. You don't want error existing and perpetuating itself and spreading. You want to catch error and you want to catch heresy. You want to catch false teachings. You want to catch immorality. The same way with uh, high-profile pastors and leaders and denominational leaders and speakers and ministry leaders. If they're in to some immoral either sexual or financial impropriety or some sin, they need to be confronted. They need to be called to repent. They shouldn't be allowed to just go ahead and carry on their ministries and carry on their church leadership as if nothing were happening. There shouldn't be the mentality of, oh, we need to protect the organization um, because if this person falls into scandal, they could hurt the whole ministry. No. The church is about the truth. And so if someone is in immorality or is a hypocrite or two-faced or teaching false doctrine, they need to be confronted. And if it means they lose their position, a platform of ministry leadership, then so be it. Because the church needs to be kept pure and the truth needs to be held higher than anyone's personality or their ministry or any one organization or church. So this is all good. And so I would say in Church Militant's case, uh, I wish Church Militant well. I hope that they continue on in their expose and criticism of church corruption. And we need more of this in the uh, evangelical world. Uh, We just have to make sure that the leaders exposing the corruption are not hypocritical themselves. We'll talk to you next week. God bless.